Yeah, thank you very much for your introduction. So, and I'm very glad to give a presentation uh, in this uh, lecture series and very happy to meet everyone. So the title of the talk today and is the quantum data center. And, and uh, I will explain what it means later. So I was uh, supported by those institutes and uh, uh, like uh, especially University of Chicago and IBM. So uh, our work is uh, together with uh, Connor Han and who is currently at AWS uh, um, Quantum and also uh, Professor Lian Jiang from the University of Chicago. So this is our archive version of the paper and welcome to Take a look. Yeah, so yeah, before I explain what it means for a quantum data center, so here is a few picture I was I generated using the current uh, state of the art AI technology and from D A L L E two from uh, uh, from Open AI. So that is the AI painter that could uh, uh, make your pictures according to your uh, natural language. And you can just put a few words and then let it draw. So I put quantum data center and it gives me like fa fantastic pictures. And then I have to mention that. So training this kind of a large scale language model like uh, the ALLE and it requires a, a key step which is called pre-training. And that step and uh, will require a large amount of resources trained in the data center. So like uh, for, um, they have like a, more than billions of uh, parameters and to train at the same time and they use lots of power. So definitely they have to use the data center to do it. So, but today I will talk about so-called quantum data center, which is supposed to be a, um, a future version of the data center. So, uh, so this talk and part of them uh, are more introductory and uh, not so that technical, but uh, some technical versions and uh, of uh, uh, of the details of our technology and the theory and it will be uh, in our paper. So, uh, welcome to take a look. And but part of this talk is uh, technical for uh, people and uh, for audience who are interested in more details about our concept and the theory applications. Okay, so just now uh, we already <laughs> introduced myself. So uh, uh, this is my background. I was born a while ago and then I was uh, uh, later and graduated from Caltech. Currently I'm working for U University of Chicago at IBM through so-called Chicago Quantum Exchange and welcome to visit me. Uh, and uh, let's start. So a quantum version of the data center and uh, is our uh, goal to that we want to discuss today. And firstly, we can take a look on the classical version of data centers. So we know that so they are widely uh, distributed and used in more than te uh, science, technology, and business. So they are almost everywhere. So like uh, they are main players like AWS, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, Alibaba, and et cetera. They have many, many data centers across the world. Actually, there's someone who gives some counting and there are nearly like 8,000 uh, 8, uh, data centers globally. So, and then there is an estimation of the uh, of a huge amount of, let's say, cloud computing industry market size, and uh, which is still growing because we have uh, more and more needs for computational power. And uh, for some reason, we need some version of data center to realize them. And we realize that uh, doing they, ma making a data center will be convenient for attack some large scale problems. And then in the quantum era, so we naturally should have a quantum version of data centers. And so that should be a combination of the cloud computing technology we currently have together with quantum computing. So here I will illustrate a quantum version of data centers and which is given from our definition. So it is from uh, an ingredient, which is called quantum random access memory and QRAM together with quantum internet or quantum network. So I will explain both of them uh, a little bit later. So, uh, and then, so this construction will show that in explicit example, it will benefit quantum computing, quantum communication, and quantum sensing, where each of them, we have several examples, and we claim 
that in fact it will be impactful in science, technology, and business. So, okay, let's start. So the outline of this talk is simple. So firstly, I will give a brief introduction of what it means. And then I will go to those uh, practical um, um, uh, uh, examples and including computing, communication, and sensing. And then finally, I will give some comments about uh, some uh, visionary picture of quantum data centers. So here we go about the basic introduction. Uh, so as I mentioned before, so the minimal definition of quantum data center that will contain the quantum internet or quantum network together with quantum random access memory. So the data stored in quantum random access memory could be either quantum or classical. So we can imagine that we have a user or a customer and connected together with the data center by the quantum network and quantum internet. And then there is a, the, the quantum data center and the, with the database, which is called Bob. And then we have quantum random access memory, the construction of QRAM that allows classical or quantum data. So the proposal that so-called quantum random access memory or so-called QRAM well, exist like a few years ago. And so the idea is that it is nothing but the following realization of uh, unitaries. So it is basically a unitary operator that will implement the above operations. So that you could have a superposition of uh, addresses and uh, then or pointers, and then starting from the zero state, and then basically you realize the unitary that will parallelize the uploading your data xi in each uh, direction i. And uh, it's important that it will preserve this proposition. So, um, and then because it's a unitary operation and the, to the start quantumly, and then it could allow the superposition of the addresses. So alpha i are arbitrary coefficients, and because this is a unitary, it's linear, it's allowed to have this superposition that uh, which is very different from classical random access memory. So which is that if you give me a superposition of addresses and then it will directly give us a, a superposition of a, of a state and according to this mathematical formula. So this expression is more designed for classical data XI where in each address and each qubit and the represented here, you will have a uh, data uh, data uploader that upload your uh, classical data XI. So, and there is another slightly different version, which is for quantum data. It was uh, slightly, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a little technical, but, um, and uh, uh, in fact, it is kind of easy to understand. So, so we're still starting from this kind of state. And then we, right now we have two subspace, uh, Q1 and Q2. And then we also have a dictionary, uh, DJ, and, uh, and uh, uh, Z store some quantum data. And then basically this uh, operation is uh, uh, kind, of pro, uh, uh, kind of doing a swap operation such that uh, uh, if I equals to J in this expression, it will upload the data, uh, a quantum state extracted from the dictionary. So otherwise it will preserve it to be zero. So that is how this uh, notation means. And then, so from this operation, we, in fact, we can find explicit realization that could realize this kind of uh, swap gates and uh, according to the existing uh, quantum data dictionary. So, um, Quantum data center and contains QRAM. Uh, as a conclusion, it will allow both quantum and classical data. And uh, classical data could be existing like classical database. And the quantum data could be the result from some quantum experiment or some measurement and some 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 quantum states that is from somewhere else. And then quantum random access memory could be also modified as quantum read only memory or other extensions. So I will not uh, talk uh, about this uh, too much. Uh, and you can check our paper for the difference between QRAM and QROM. So the key difference is that uh, QROM is a more classical version so of uh, QRAM. So in fact, it's not really that quantum. So it's more like a, a traditional kind of linear table 
structure uh, of the uh, of the data structure uh, that and then it will be able to and um, store those classical data and then it cannot allow the superposition uh, and that uh, in, in a manifest way and then so so it is easier and cheaper to build uh, but uh, today, uh, although in fact we can generalize our definition that includes QROM or even hybrid version of QRAM or QROM, but today I will mostly only talk about QRAM. So yeah, so if there is any questions, uh, you can ask me in the middle. Okay, yeah, so furthermore, so uh, natural outputs uh, of this kind of construction is that uh, if you allow quantum cloud computation, so that uh, you could, uh, in a quantum data center, you could perform a unitary, and then so, uh, and then that is the natural extension of existing data center, where one of the most important functions is to perform cloud computation, but right now the computation could be quantum, so which is that you just perform a unitary according to a given quantum algorithm. So, uh, so, but just now what I'm talking about is the basic concepts and it sounds like uh, not that concrete, but in fact, so all those functions and I was mentioned just now uh, could be shown by explicitly examples where we indeed find benefits by combining quantum communication, quantum network together uh, with quantum random access memory. So, and today I will explicitly talk about three examples, which is uh, originally discovered by us. So um, for, of course, for quantum data centers, I will mention later that it will be a natural realization of quantum oracles that is realized in almost all, I mean, quantum algorithms that requires data. Uh, for instance, uh, HHL algorithm about uh, sparse, uh, um, sparse, uh, sparse uh, operator, sparse matrix inversion, and also the Hamiltonian simulation algorithm that requires you upload the Hamiltonian. Uh, in that case, the quantum data center naturally serve as a physical realization of oracles because it contains QRAM. So on the other hand, I will provide a explicit example where a quantum data center will serve as a T-gate library in full torrent quantum computation, more precisely surface code quantum computation. And then furthermore, I will talk about quantum communication and where there is a natural realization uh, of quantum data centers which is uh, called quantum private query and blind quantum computing. And then based on that, we just, uh, de develop a new scheme, which is called multi-party private quantum communication that uh, allows you to realize some functions that I will discuss later. So finally, I will talk about extra benefit of quantum data center where a perfect realization for quantum sensing is gonna be distributed sensing. So in that particular case, and we will have some, I mean, some restricted subspace and from sensing, like a single photon sensing in quantum sensing. And in that case, quantum data center uh, will play an important role inside. So this is outline of the examples that uh, I will talk about. So let's go through them briefly. So first, quantum data center for quantum, uh, for quantum computing. And we know that T gate and uh, 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 and also it's related process about magic state distillation. So they are expensive in quantum computing and that algorithm is, is not very easy. So we assume that a localized database that actually could serve as a resource for T gates. So imagine that our user, uh, they cannot have that many T gates, which is hard to pro uh, produce. And then we can use a data center to do it. So those gates could be teleported uh, between quantum data center and user by the quantum internet or quantum net. So that will serve us as a perfect replication of a quantum data center towards efficient quantum computing. And in this case, and because we outsource the hardware cost, and then that will, that will save the cost of users. And then depending on the quantum teleportation or quantum communication scheme, so in that case, um, uh, we will have uh, further uh, saving in time and uh, instead of space uh, for the user. So an explicit example we have provided 
and uh, based on existing paper about the uh, surface code quantum computation. So it is based on this person, Daniel Linsky's paper a few years ago uh, about realizing this uh, uh, ticket counting in uh, some general defined uh, quantum algorithms. Where our setup is that we assume that uh, we have a 100 qubit algorithm. So that requires 10 to the eighth uh, tickets and in the full torrent quantum computation. And then we assume that uh, it was a 10 to the minus three and uh, physical uh, error rate and uh, for user devices and total 1% uh, computational error. So firstly, according to this paper, we can select and uh, the proper version of uh, different full torrent schemes like Zia, like the different versions of the surface code and then, uh, and then for their code distance and, uh, and, and, and the dimensions. So, uh, and then we could, uh, for the given T gate number, we could uh, try to figure out according to this uh, error requirement, we could try to figure out which kind of a quantum error correction scheme we are going to use. So, and then based on this, we can make an estimation as a, about uh, advantage from quantum data center because basically we outsource the um, outsource the T gates and then that will give us a safety feeling saving for the users. Um, and that is depending significantly on the quantum communication delays uh, that we define a factor which is called delay time. So that will be a typical time scale. So that appears in quantum communication that's because of uh, when we are scheduling the task and then there will be a delay because of quantum communication because that will be not uh, instantaneously and that depends on your quantum communication cost. And, and at least it is limited by the speed of the light. And then there will be a delay time for scheduling task becomes uh, uh, of, of, for the distant user. So, and then we find that for lower delay time, we could actually reduce the code distance and then for instance, here is a specific realization of the quantum error correction code with given um, code distance. Uh, and, then, and then according to this plot, you could say that for delay the time, so more uh, smaller and smaller, um, smaller and smaller delay time, you actually require a lower distance. So that means that a quantum data center has like more efficient uh, teleportation of the state. And furthermore, we could compute the hardware cost where this red dash line remains that the relative qubit number is like one, which means that there is no savings. But if you keep reducing the delay time and then you will get more and more, um, uh, more, more and more savings for the number of qubits and also the relative wrong time. So specifically, I will give, give more detail about this plot. And actually you could replace the the delay time. So by the scaling of the size of the database. So uh, so as I mentioned, I didn't emphasize in this text that much about the role of QRAM in it. But in fact, you could, for the given size of the qubits and the database, and then you could uh, try to figure out how the delay time is depending on the size of the database. So if you use the naive version of QRAM that uh, you just uh, uh, you just uh, ask a quantum data center to do uh, to do the task by specifying every uh, data or every components uh, appearing in QRAM, and then for in that case that will uh, require uh, this de uh, delay time has to be scaling proportional to the size of the data database. However, you could also and uh, teleport the T gates by specifying the address from quantum data centers uh, for appearing the QRAM appeared in the quantum data centers. And in that case, the delay time will be proportional to logarithmic of N. So where A is a database. And then so that will be a further significant saving of the relative hardware cost and the corresponding running time. So we did an experimental estimation of that as a typical example where quantum data center could save us some computational cost and according to this uh, T gate count. Yeah, so if there is no further questions, I will go to uh, quantum communication part. Is there any questions? Yeah, okay, uh, great. So another application of quantum data center is uh, quantum communication. 
So uh, uh, the scheme is uh, based on the so-called quantum primary theory. So that is one of the most important application of QRAN that propose and around the time where QRAN concept appears. So uh, that is actually, we find it's a natural application of quantum data center because it combines QRAN and quantum teleportation. So the idea is the following. So uh, right now I have a database, uh, which is called Bob, and also a user, which is Alice. And then I want to check some data and from that database. But I don't want the database to know which data I'm checking. So basically, I'm preserving the data security and privacy of what I'm doing. So ideally, so uh, it's uh, it, uh, practically you could do this by maybe by some uh, encryption decryption schemes, but on Zia based on complexity theory. Uh, another alternative version of the story uh, the, from the spirit of quantum communication, many related studies is using the fundamental law of physics, like a non cloning theorem or uh, superposition, and uh, to protect uh, the data security. So, how we realize this? Uh, so, firstly, we, we, we know that uh, this can be perfectly realized using QRA because uh, Alice is going to uh, address the data. So, Alice could send the send address J and to the database, and the database will return you, and by applying the QRAM unitaries, that will return you a, a, a data that is associated with the address. So that is easy to understand. And in this case, and we can have to use QRAM and together with quantum teleportation. Uh, but a, a more advanced usage with the, for the quantum private query is that to take a look at, on the quantum superposition you could use. Uh, in quantum random access. So the scheme is the following. So first, Alice will uh, teleport the state to Bob, but firstly, he will teleport a single state. And secondly, he can teleport a superposition between that single state and zero state, where I assume that the zero state corresponds to some fixed uh, uh, fixed uh, computational basis, say, and uh, Alice already know that the answer of that uh, zero state is A0, which is equal to zero, or something like that, some fixed number. So what Alice could do is to teleport these two states on different time to Bob. And then importantly, uh, Alice will not infer Bob which state will be teleported first. So, um, Bob knows that Alice will sequentially teleport two states, but Bob does not know which one corresponds to which one, which one is a superposition state and which is one is another basis state. And then Bob will return the data and uh, to Alice according to Alice's uh, order. And which is that firstly, in the first case, it is just uh, the AJ. And in the second case, it's just uh, gives you a superposition of AJ and uh, zero. So, how to protect the security in that way. So we notice that in the security, uh, it's guaranteed by the following. So as long as that, uh, Bob is taking a look on the data by quantum measurement, and then that will be noticed by Alice in some probability, in some constant probability, which could be improved uh, uh, towards one in an arbitrary close level. So uh, in this case, the, the reason is that because as long, so firstly, there is no cloning theorem and the Bob cannot copy the state. He cannot store the states directly based on his operation. So what Bob will do is when, when he is uh, destroying the privacy of Alice is to measure the state. If you measure the state, it will be destroyed and this superposition, uh, mm, superposition kind of structure. And then that will be immediately noticed by Alice. Uh, so that is the point of this uh, operation, and which is that using this way, and we have a probability to detect a constant probability. Actually, in this case, it will be one or four uh, to de detect if uh, Bob is cheating. And uh, change, well, with some more advanced schemes that uh, described in our paper, so we can actually achieve this by arbitrary, um, arbitrary. Uh, a probability that is close to one. So that is the idea of a quantum private theory. And, uh, and then, so there are some rigorous security analysis and security estimation of this protocol. And then, 
So the idea is to use some mutual information. Uh, say that uh, you are have a probability to detect the cheating and uh, which is proportional to epsilon. So, and then you can compute the maximal allowed mutual information between Alice and Bob, quantum mutual information, which corresponds to how much and Bob is allowed to cheating and how much Bob is allowed to retrieve the data from an Alice. And then you will find that, um, so so the, the mutual information will be bounded by some, some function related to epsilon. So which is where, where one minus epsilon is a probability that uh, Bob, uh, that, that, uh, um, um, uh, that uh, Alice could uh, detect completely if uh, Bob is cheating work. So it sounds a little complicated, but uh, I recommend you to uh, read in more detail in our paper. So there is a natural extension of that scheme, so which is called blind quantum computation. So what it means is uh, similar, and uh, I mean by sim simply combining this protocol to the uh, to the unitary operations used by quantum cloud computing, the idea is that using blind quantum computing, and then Alice could uh, could uh, let Bob to compute something and uh, return the the result as a quantum state. And that will be realized by a unitary operation that's performed in the Bob side. And importantly, and Bob does not need to know which unitary operation uh, Alice is specified. So by associating with each operation with the address uh, from Alice, and then Bob, and it does not really, really know which kind of operations Alice wants to perform. And then if Bob wants to say, and Alice will immediately know. So in that, that is called blind phone computation, which is a natural extension of this scheme. And then we naturally include this in the concept of quantum data sets. Yeah. So another side of the story we want to talk about is quantum secret sharing. So which is uh, roughly explained as a follow. So quantum secret sharing is that if you have some secrets that's going to be uh, provided as a quantum state, there are some uh, there are some secret sharing protocol either for quantum data or classical data, and the goal is that and it could be um, just split in several smaller Hilbert spaces, smaller states, and then uh, each independent uh, state cannot recover the whole secret unless some of them comes together and then he will uh, recover the full information. So uh, so then if you split the secret to multiple people and uh, each of them cannot just independently recover the secret. So you can notice that this spirit is very uh, similar to quantum error correction code. And then in fact, uh, in one of the earliest papers that specifically specifying quantum secret sharing for, uh, uh, for the quantum data, and that uh, use uh, a duality between the quantum secret sharing scheme and the quantum error correction scheme. So our original protocol is uh, basically combining this um, uh, uh, quantum secret sharing and quantum private care. So our blind quantum computation, I was mentioned just now. So the idea is that uh, we have a bunch of users, uh, which, are, which are Alice, and another bunch of users, which are Bob. And then in the middle, we have some quantum data centers. And then uh, the, 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 the goal that we want to achieve is that we want the Bob to receive the information, but uh, Bob does not know which Alice is sending which information. So which is that I just uh, don't want to reveal that information, that uh, which kind of information is from which Alice or we, or, and, and the, the, it corresponds to, uh, corresponds to which uh, specific information. And the idea is that firstly, we use quantum secret sharing, and then we use the quantum error correction code to break information, and then we teleport them to all quantum data centers. It could have multiple data, quantum data centers. And then uh, use their quantum data center. So we will use quantum private query, and then we will send that information to Bob. So, and then notice that these uh, quantum data centers have a dictionary, and then those dictionary and will contain the QRAM and uh, give the same like a quantum private query and uh, as we, uh, we, we had before, and then we send them to Bob. So 
using this combined uh, method, so we show that and combining those two, and firstly, uh, Bob will cannot know which Alice is sending which information. And also Bob cannot know which, uh, can, we, we completely cannot, uh, we are not uh, mm, uh, have the, uh, have, mm, make the quantum data center to, count, to have that information. So this is private also against the quantum data center as well. Okay, great. So finally, I will discuss quantum data center, its application, ap application for quantum sensing. So the idea is based on the following concepts, which is also originally discovered in our paper. So which is that quantum data center could be used for quantum data compression. So in this case, we are specifically looking at the following states. And then, so which is called a uh, unary uh, state, which is that uh, we are putting those addresses I was mentioned above and to a specific uh, delta function. So the reason that this delta function appears here is because we are restricting it to, to the single subspace, single qubit sub, uh, single mode subspace. And then basically we want to realize this specific quantum data compression task because it is a single subspace with a single charge, you know, say U1 symmetric system preserving the charge. And then we want to compress that data to a binary representation. So which is that we just restrict it to a subspace. So this reduction of dimension is from N to log N. So how do we realize that? So we, it, uh, it, it was, uh, it was done use a slightly modified version of quantum random access memory. So, uh, and we also described the explicit real realization of that protocol uh, using the existing uh, uh, manifest realization of human. So based on the hardware side. So firstly, it will use a slightly modified uh, QRAM query. So as the following. So where you sort of, uh, um, uh, so firstly you have this kind of superposition states uh, similar and you add it with zero. And then we will, we will just uh, directly upload this corresponding I for each alpha I to those addresses. And so that we show that, so that is a slightly modified version of QRAM. And secondly, we will use QRAM for quantum data to just uh, realize this operation that finally we get the binary application by directly use QRAM uh, by treating this delta as a database. So it sounds a little, again, it sounds a little technical, but uh, it, it, it contains like twice usage of QRAM. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the combination of them will give the desired quantum data compression schemes. So let me uh, briefly explain uh, the, the explicit usage of this kind of scheme. So because it could be used for data compression, so specifically for, there are many um, quantum data, sen uh, quantum sensing schemes that uh, we often need to transmit states between different lo locations. Say that uh, we have a so-called quantum telescope that um, there are, we are detecting some, some photons uh, in the space uh, using quantum sensing technology. And those photons are of course quantum. So, and then those are quantum states. And uh, if it is a single photon and say that we are doing a single photon detection. And then we naturally know that this single photon is has a, the, the photon number is proceed, uh, preserved. So if we use uh, to store the information using the whole Hebra space, it will be, be like a waste of uh, resources. So, what we could do is that, as I described before, we could do quantum data compression using quantum random access memory. And then in this case, and it perfectly realized the scheme where the single uh, subface could be appearing. And then we could imagine that so this telescope is kind of distributed and in each place we have a quantum detector and then we compress the data uh, using QRAM. And then we are connected together to combine the information of all those, uh, all those uh, telescopes or all those detectors 
And uh, then using, because we are, uh, uh, we are reducing the dimensional recuperate space and uh, to significantly from N to log N, so that uh, definitely reduce the uh, entanglement overhead that we have to pay during the distributed quantum sensing uh, uh, technology because uh, we don't need to teleport the high, uh, that high dimensional quantum states. So that is the way that we, we use the quantum data compression directly uh, for quantum sensing. And then we describe all those explicit schemes on this two-step realization that requires usage of quantum random access memory in our paper. Okay, so that's it. And then aside from the example that I was mentioning uh, before, we actually have more examples. Uh, for, uh, for specifically for quantum computing, that we also mentioned that quantum data center could be served as a natural version of quantum oracles. And then that will be appear everywhere, like in Google research in HHL or in Hamiltonian simulation. And in our paper, we specifically define, uh, discuss uh, how to compute the overall cost function. And for the Hamiltonian simulation task that you could potentially have in say in, in your quantum computer. So, and then for the sensing task, we also discuss quantum channel discrimination and uh, using uh, quantum sensing and also quantum data centers together. So, and then as I mentioned before, so for quantum communication, we have uh, quantum private queries and blind quantum computation. And these, uh, those examples will feel a very good picture that quantum data center could indeed provide us several significant benefits. Yeah, is there any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, let me move to the final comments of the talk. Uh, so there are extra functions that we didn't discuss in detail about the talk. And we are showing this, uh, showing those uh, features and more by examples. But however, it could have other features. And then we didn't provide an explicit example, but we believe that it's a natural direction that uh, someone could study. So firstly, quantum data center could be naturally assisted by quantum transduction. So uh, the reason is because as we might know, and uh, there are uh, right now for quantum teleportation and quantum network technology, we have photons. But uh, right now, sometimes we use contacting qubits uh, to perform the quantum hardware computation. And then you need a quantum transduction that is transducing a different form of quantum information. So quantum data centers could be naturally combined with quantum transduction technology and provide a different realization of uh, quantum hardware and quantum uh, qubit realization for uh, different customers. And then furthermore, we discussed in detail and the quantum data center could also define both reading and writing and the interior. So reading means that, uh, uh, that you just want to read some data and the writing means that you not only want to read, but also you want to change the data by some quantum operations. And then, so in our paper, we also discuss in detail and we find that quantum data center could allow both doing reading and writing and more operations. And uh, furthermore, so quantum data center could also be modular. So that we have currently, we have also distributed quantum data, data center everywhere that there are people like uh, in machine learning, for instance, study distributed optimization or federated learning. And then many of them are realized by data centers that are modular and distributed. And then naturally, so this will be a decentralized version of the quantum data center also. And finally, I want to mention that quantum data center will uh, require novel quantum data structures. So we didn't discuss this in detail, uh, but I mean, QRAM or QROM that I mentioned in the talk is a naive version of, uh, a, a, sorry, not naive, but a simple version of a quantum version of data centers that especially QRAM, it could realize some functions that um, uh, that uh, that classical data structure does not have, which is a superposition of addresses. Uh, and then for more different data structures, we could imagine that we could have a quantum version of a list table or a hash table, 
or even like other kind of data structures like skip table and also some linear list and also uh, trees and uh, graphs and more complicated data, data structures. And uh, they will potentially realize different functions like uh, searching and sorting, insertion, deletion, and also transfers or updating, writing, and et cetera, but just like what we study in the classical data structure. And especially in the quantum data center uh, and study in the quantum data study, uh, data center study, we have this uh, part of QRAM, which are kind of a normal quantum data structure that uh, does not have a very explicit classical analog. And then we are still working on this and uh, we hope that uh, we could discover some more original data structures that does not have any sort of quantum, a classical analog at all. So uh, we point out that quantum data structure is the initial room that is combining between the software and hardware of quantum algorithm related studies towards the quantum hardware realization. And then that requires something in the middle, which is a quantum data structure. Finally, and a quantum data center could potentially benefit business science and, and the several industry like big data or machine learning. And then we also provide examples and in, in the business, and there are something about uh, security enhancement and how classical data centers could be merged to quantum, and there are also cloud services. And for machine learning and big data related study, it could be about uh, QRAM-based algorithms and its corresponding development, and also its connection to quantum internet, quantum teleportation, like the distributed optimization that I mentioned just now. And uh, furthermore, so it will benefit the physical science and uh, like the chemistry and material science, biology, finance, and climate science, climate science which are candidates of uh, potential applications that uh, quantum te technology could have. Um, and then uh, we show that in examples where quantum data center could benefit all of them. And uh, so it will be a very good thing to build. And uh, for that is uh, naturally as an extension of the existing data centers. Uh, so aside from that, finally, I want to emphasize where I want to mention that uh, quantum data center hardware realization is hard. So currently we have to be uh, expect this in the long term, but in the near term, it is challenging to realize QRAM, either QRAM uh, or um, QRAM or, um, uh, or quantum network. It is still challenging, although we already have made uh, some progresses. And then I guess for quantum network, there are lots of quantum teleportation kind of experiment. And uh, also for QRAM, there are also experimental trials on realizing them. And then like which kind of QRAM realization is hardware efficient and potentially is there any full torrent version of uh, quantum random access memory. Where for those things, although we have made uh, significant progress, but uh, there are still uh, um, uh, still large amount of challenge. So we only expect this um, um, in the long-term future as a visionary picture. However, so it may not be realized in the inter in immediately. For instance, in the noisy um, uh, kind of uh, uh, quantum computing era, so which is the NISC era. So it is very hard to realize. Uh, however, so on the other hand, we could reduce the re requirement uh, of uh, quantum uh, quantum data centers. Like if we cannot build QRAM, we just use QRAM. So, or some hybrid version of them. So, or we could imagine that some hybrid version of quantum and the classical kind of teleportation and all of them are possible. And then maybe some partial functions could be beneficial for some near-term study, but uh, we um, essentially emphasize that uh, uh, this thing is gonna be realized in the long-term in visionary, uh, as a visionary goal. So that is uh, the, the, the almost all I want to talk about today. And thank you very much uh, for your attendance. And aside from that, so, um, so let me try to give an advertisement that uh, about, um, about something else. So it is related to data centers and data security, but it's about uh, um, a software that, uh, and a, a kind of a scientific research combined with software we have built, which is called Security Chicago. So that is uh, about the decentralization and uh, enhanced data security in the Web3 or blockchain platform. 
but uh, that will be potentially also related to data centers and uh, in the distributed way. And that will be against uh, comprehensive attacks and uh, including quantum, especially with the help of uh, post-quantum cryptography. That was the classical protocols that were against potential quantum hacking or so quantum attacks. So for, for this, um, uh, it's more like an advertisement and not related to the primary topic of this talk, but uh, I want to briefly mention this. And if there is any audience who are interested in this kind of uh, um, uh, story and which has a uh, potential to get commercialized, so I would say so, so we can discuss later. But uh, in any sense for quantum data center work, and thank you very much for attendance, and, and I'm happy to take any sort of questions. Okay, thank you so much for a very insightful talk. So um, I, actually, uh, before we enter the QA, I, I have a very short question. So do you think the, the quantum RAM, uh, QRAM can be realized in the near term, or is there any engineering obstacles uh, prevent, prevent us to achieve that the QRAM? Yeah, so, so great. So that's a great question. So, uh, so we don't think a large scale full torrent version of QRAM could be realized in near terms. So there are uh, groups that are trying to realize this. For instance, our close friend in the University of Chicago, David Huster, who is a world leading expert and uh, working on uh, QRAM and probably he could uh, be responsible for at least one of the best uh, kind of possible QRAM realization of the world. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, however, so this thing is only like a, for a very few amount of qubits. So the primary challenge of the hardware um, uh, is uh, is the scalability and also especially the full connectivity. So this requires a this operation, current operation really requires like a dense connectivity to all of the qubits and then in order to make them have the superposition or have them entangled. And they have complicated structure made from the, um, from, from the swap gates. And then, so that, uh, that, that kind of uh, um, uh, connectivity is very hard to realize and uh, very challenging. And then uh, currently, I think they are still working on to realizing this using some swap gates and there are some tasks that uh, we have to overcome in order to build this QRAM. And uh, it's very challenging and uh, to realize them. So I, I think aside from this, so we don't expect that uh, this will be realized and mature immediately. And uh, furthermore, so it's even harder to realize them into, uh, into four torrents. And uh, uh, people try to estimate how many physical qubits you need to realize this to be full torrents and the number will be huge. And uh, and then so so that is another challenge. And some pro proposal has been made about that. But an interesting fact uh, about QRAM, I would tell is that um, actually the noisy version, even the noisy version of QRAM could be simulated classically and using polynomial time. So this is uh, done by another work that, uh, uh, which is listed in our reference in Neon Jones group previously, where in that case, we, we simulate QRAM to a lower scale. And uh, so although it is uh, something that's hard to realize in the form of hardware, but uh, it's, it's also classically simulatable that we could, uh, in fact, uh, simulate uh, QRAM in a large scale device. So in the near term, we could do some numerical experiments that's related. But uh, I mean, to realize this kind of operation using logarithmic, uh, depths and in the hardware is very hard. And uh, currently, what people do is to use QROM mostly in their, for instance, like a Hamiltonian simulation task. Uh, there's a paper by Google and on PRX about this, and they basically use QROM data structure. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, thank you. I think there is one question from the chat, and or uh, other audience, you can uh, unmute yourself or type in the chat so but we can start yeah. with in the chat yeah so so yes so we can take a look on the questions uh mm -hmm. so firstly uh the question is that we discussed the pure coin uh data center design and uh, we didn't discuss the possible integration between classical and quantum computing is that possible path towards qdc before 
QRAM will be ver uh, or, uh, available. Uh, although we didn't discuss that definitely in this talk, but uh, this is also a topic that uh, we uh, we work on. So we define QRAM to be, uh, we define quantum data center to be a, co a combination of QRAM together with quantum network, but we could reduce the requirement. So for instance, uh, in the appendix, actually, we did discuss an example of a quantum data center using uh, a channel uh, uh, for, for, for sensing tasks like channel discrimination. So that is an example like uh, don't require, really require QRAM. So this, uh, it will be a natural integration by reducing the requirement. And for instance, you could change, as I mentioned, QRAM to QROM or like hybrid version, which is at least the QRAM could be realized in the near term. So that is not that hard to do. So that is basically a quantum version of, a, say, a linear list. Uh, and then, so, but, uh, and then, so also we could reduce the uh, quantum network to classical teleportation, especially say, if your quantum algorithm performed in the quantum data center is doing quantum computation, but the outcome is a classical result instead of a quantum state. For instance, if you are, want to perform, say, Schwarz algorithm, so that result could be classical because, because it is just a factor in large number to some smaller numbers. And you don't need to just uh, uh, teleport to the, the quantum state. You just need to get the out outcome of that uh, factory result. And then in that case, the result is classical. So, and then you could uh, teleport those uh, results using classical kind of network. And then for that, if you scale the problem to be large, that thing gonna, it's gonna be a combination of uh, quantum computation together with classical, uh, uh, classical network. So part of them could be reduced uh, to be partially classical. And that will be what we have in mind about the hybrid version where some of them might be realized in near term. So hopefully that answers your question. So, and also uh, Jilin asked a question that uh, uh, QDC provide another version of the application that uh, about the information sharing and uh, and then quantum data will be more popular over classical data in quantum data center. So, or do you think quantum computer will operating system uh, will have operating system after achieving QRAM? Or yes. So, uh, if so, firstly for the first uh, question, uh, uh, so so for for that so that really depends on the usage. So, uh, I think uh currently what we mostly have is a classical data. Uh, so for instance, uh, for instance like a uh, like a recommendation system or a healthcare or everywhere is data classical. And I, ha I have never heard of them to be quantum. So quantum is more used. For instance, like in sensing, and if you need a single photon sensing and or detecting dark matter or uh, some other examples where you actually have to teleport states. And then in those cases, and then you have to use quantum data. Otherwise the data will be intrinsically from the classical world. And then I don't really uh, have a, uh, have an expectation on which part of the data uh, will be more popular in the long-term future. But uh, in the near term, of course, a classic data is, is more and then uh, in a but in the in the future and then maybe there will be more quantum data and for instance the data from the physical experiment or when quantum computing is much more popular than right now and have, can, can be used uh, a, in a more popular way and then in that case quantum data will be more popular than classical data and then a uh, quantum computer will have operating system after achieve QRAM, yes. So if you if you achieve QRAM, it's basically a basic version of the data structure. And that could be built in the hardware level, but uh, some other data structure could be built in the software level. And then uh, above from that, there are like the uh, algorithms and also software implementation we have in quantum computers. And uh, of course we have to make a uh, operating system that uh, if you have a QRAM, and then that uh, will be more convenient. And also it is a natural extension of the classical operating system. And uh, that will be a very good uh, uh, question to ask. And uh, I believe that there are already some research in the computer system community. So there's another question that uh, the concept of QRAM really strikes me. Okay, thank you. So here is my question. Can you explain the difference between uh, QRAM and QROM? And I think uh, 
QRM consents some unitary uh, operators to upload the information. But uh, what about uh, the, the structure of QRM? Okay, so good question. <clears throat> the QRM is more like a binary tree kind of structure. If you uh, if you put uh, a quantum state and then inside and then the output will give directly directed to the binary tree and then finally will tell, uh, di direct you to the quantum state. But uh, the QROM is a linear structure and then basically it was uh, just uh, using like one location, but uh, it will sequentially in the depths it will have multiple data that has been uploaded. So more precisely, QRAM is more close to parallel computation, and QRAM QROM is something like a, not a parallel, like it's just ordinary computation, something like that. So as a conclusion, QRAM will have have complete uh, um, have more uh, saving in time, but uh, more consuming in space. But QROM we all have a more consuming the space, uh, so but uh, so, uh, more consuming the time, but uh, not that uh, consuming in space. Uh, um, more precisely, if you have a data size n, so the circuit depths or the timing of a QRAM will be log n, but uh, the but 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 the space that you need is n qubits, so that is really large. It is still polynomial though, but it's really a large kind of space. However, for QROM, so it will have a polynomial and even more kind of circuit depths. In fact, it's n times log n, that length of circuit depths. And uh, however, it will uh, only require log n qubits. So it will save a number of qubits, but uh, it will be more consuming in time. So uh, a combination design of a hybrid version of QRAM and QROM, that will require so a uh, sophisticated uh, trade-off between space and time complexity. So that is the answer to your question. And if you're interested, you could check uh, our paper for details and uh, some further references. Where in the, especially in the appendix, we discuss the, how to make this trade-off between space and time codes together with the privacy consideration in a specific quantum data center application.